Okay, so moving swiftly on, we have what, Rita? Ladies, is that, is that right? right. Um, looking at trust and transparency and accountability relevant of governance in UK charities. <coughs> So again, just while uh, Rita sets up, we'll have, um, I've seen that Dr. Mohamed Hadoud is here, he's going to be our discussant, and then we'll have a, a, a few minutes for questions as well, um, and then, then we'll have a break, so uh, thank you for your patience, and over to you, Rita. Good morning. Transparency and accountability, the relevance of governance in UK charities. Historical development. We're looking at charities, but before we actually get there, we will do a comparison, or I'll be doing a comparison with or talking about philanthropy and charity because we tend to go hand in hand. Philanthropy existed so many years before charities come into being. And charities existed on the branch of philanthropy, and the work of charities are there to help to really <coughs> alleviate situations like crisis when they actually happen. But philanthropy has always been there, and they're there not to eliminate the problems but to eliminate the social discourse that cause things to happen. For example, when I say charities are there to help, if there is, for example, a tsunami, charities are there to be relief. But with the philanthropy work, they're there to help to make sure it doesn't happen in the future or in other places. I am writing about governance and charities. Charity work is really good. Charity work is um, these days revolve around government funding, but also public funding. Individual donors, legacies, major donors that give money to help charities. Hence the whole reason of governance, the whole reason of the public outcry. So the next section to that, I'm talking about the scandals which were resulted in some of the demise of some of the charities that have existed. Here when we talk about the scandals, there's outcry scrutiny for transparency, for accountability. For transparency, <coughs> the money in, and they expect to see the work that is done in the charities. Unfortunately, it's been reporting at the end of the, the accounting period, charities are supposed to be accountable for their work. If you look at the charities' um, annual uh, um, accounts, usually, up to, depending on the size of the charity, you get 60 pages, you get 100 plus pages for how many things are they going to write in there for people to see that's something they're going to take into account. But again, the latest scandals, I would look at big ones that have come to mind. We look at the Jimmy Seven 2014 scandal. <coughs> we look at 2015, we look at Big the Green. We look at Kids Company. We look at um, the, the Oxfam scandal and UNICEF saved children related that happened recently. And then just over the weekend, um, the MBS medicine before Frontier, pardon my French, is not very good. That again has come into, into light. So this topic sort of go on and on and on, and it needs the whole issue of reporting transparency and accountability into the workplace. My research will be based will be based on charities in the UK. Yes, some of them have got affiliation or are internationally connected as well. But I'm working on England and Wales, Scotland, and 
know the dialect. Information is collected to give the final results and figures as we make them according to the size and number of registered charities. Up to 2016, we had a total of 180 plus thousand registered charities, about 164 in England and Wales, about 22, 24,000 in Scotland, about 6,000 in Northern Ireland. The total income for these charities is about 98 billion pounds for the three charities put together. Northern Ireland for its size is for one of the those more, the charity income is really, really surprising if it was compared to the others. It's, it is a significant figure. <coughs> okay. My study, Coffee Governance, Accountability and Transparency. In the middle, I've got the gap, which is the norms, which is the which covers the gap in the norms. We we'll now talk about the relationship between the three. Corporate governance is in the middle, and in there is got <coughs> accountability and transparency hooked together. So the main connection after looking at corporate governance, looking at the work done on corporate governance, we look about accountability. How is the work of corporate governance? The people that are running the, the charities, we look at the board, we look at the trustees, how the charities run, what type of accountability do they employ, what about transparency, is there any, what is the gap in between, I'm sure we can go look at quite a few people who are not sure the standards, what have they found it. There is a lot of work I have to do, I know, <laughs> because, because I am in such an early stage of my research, so there is a lot of work I've got to cover in addressing the issues here. The relevance and importance of the sector. Charities are there to help, they do quite a lot of work. Areas like the government don't work, the government, yes, of course, as I said, a lot of those help towards um, the work they're doing. There's that corporate uh, partnership where businesses are using charities to make funds and likewise charities are using uh, corporate to increase their, their donors for the work that they do. But the scope of my study here, I'm looking at this crime for for scrutiny, this guy for transparency of the public and charities being talked about, being complained about, their transparency, their accountability, their corporate governance is not good enough and so I would address this, having got a minute experience in working with charities and hopefully work on the three constructs and then address the gap by the time I finish my research, or towards finishing my research. Here I'm looking at the progress of my main questions of the, of, of the research. So I guess the nature of the board, which is the nature of the board in charity organizations, therefore are involved with the corporate governance itself of the charities. How are they managed? How are they run? How are they governed? And then to look at what kinds of transparency and accountability in UK charities. In looking at some of the annual reports, we do see information from the chairman, from the board, they use information apart from the annual figures of what, what their income was for the particular year they're reporting on, and 
the expenditure of the particular year in reporting on, but you've got all sorts of information which we need to talk about their accountability and their transparency. And then what I'm going to link corporate governance again with the accountability and transparency, which I talked about, I showed it the diagram earlier on. And therefore, the whole set of questions we look at how affecting scoping problems within the sector. The inability for framework. I'm looking at this page you've already done <coughs> by authors in the field, academics, students, and other researchers. And to in the public governments, I'm looking at the agency theory, stakeholder, and stewardship theory. And here, I've got one or two important authors that I've looked at for only the meeting on corporate governance. Come forth, Heinemann, Heinemann and Melvin, and so many others, but I can only just pick a few in here. And when we look at the agency theory, we are looking at agency networking. There's so many others. Let's do this in research. And of course, when we talk about um, stakeholder theory, we start off with the main person himself, Dr. Freeman. We've got Man and Kuvold, Andrea Akulera made a comment recently on stakeholder theory. Then on stewardship theory, I look at Handelman again and McDonald. McDonald covered in quite a lot on corporate governance and accountability. So the whole areas of, of the study will then be analyzed. The how do you discuss to get my um, theoretical framework and underpin the study and the backing up? Here, my design and my philosophy are based on the assumption that the notion of sexuality of corporate governance or the charity organizations do exist in a social, economic, and political space. A lot of demand, a lot of questions, and the parliament is involved in making that affects charities, that affects their operation. Charities are have got four to see or try to be involved in financial decisions. Charities most of the time do petition parliament in decisions that might that should go in their favor or that benefits them in, in their role. Some charities have got closely and with and with the local MPs or MPs in general who take them um, sort of uh, pay attention to what they do and so on. In the major epistemological assumption, the knowledge of the norms will therefore come into play again. Accountability and transparency with public governance is being talked about over and over and over again because that's what the, 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 the research is about. Accountability. How are charities accounting for the money that are given to them? Are they going wisely? Do they say they are doing what they want to do? Of course, when you talk about how the money is spent, in this part of my research, I am not going to go into directors because that's another issue. I'm going to leave that completely and I'm going to pretend I am not hearing that side of transparency and accountability in the charities. The 
the research finally will be based on an interpretive uh, paradigm. I will be using a qualitative data method. I'll be talking to or try to interview um, key personnel in, in various charities. I'll be doing a documentary and then discourse analysis. So broadly, my data will be based on a grounded approach to understanding the breadth of depth of the nuances of accountability, transparency, corporate governance within my research. Thank you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> based on your proposal, uh, which I found was uh, well written, uh, very clear, well articulated. Uh, what I particularly liked is the background you gave, uh, which really justified the need for your research, which is which is very important. So to understand why, why, this, why this research is taking place. Um, again, I mean, your presentation was, was, was very interesting uh, with lots of information. Um, now, what I'm missing, uh, and that's may, maybe something you may think about, uh, at this early stage is um, I didn't see uh, how does you how your topic engage with the uh, current conversation that is taking place in the literature so uh, in other words uh, I didn't see that how is your research taking the current studies uh, further so uh, in the more traditional words um, I was looking for uh, a clear picture of your contribution uh, and, and a research gap that is existing in the literature. So, uh, I mean, I, I suspect you have your background is in the charity sector. Can I just say something bits. on that? Yeah, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry, when I, I said this, it was with him. I was sort of um, thinking of don't make too much slides and all the sort of things. So I just sort of condense things and so on. My contribution, therefore, is, is in the gap in the, in the nones. Mm -hmm. Because most articles, you read articles that have been written on corporate governance and charities, corporate governance and accounting, corporate governance and transparency. But what I haven't seen is corporate governance, accountability and transparency. And that's what's going to be my, my um, contribution in addressing that gap. So that was the gap I was talking about, but maybe I didn't go into, not maybe I okay. didn't go into it properly for yeah, you to have seen what I've just said right now. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank it does. you very Thank much. You. Uh, so going back to the uh, questions I said you, you, you answered uh, through the presentation, uh, basically my questions were, well, one of them was about the context which you, you've answered, you said is you, you basically made it on the UK, um, because I've seen charities that were uh, from different countries, so I wasn't sure whether you were for, you taking a global sample or just focusing on the UK. On, UK as a context. Uh, my other question was going to be about the size of the charities you're, you're considering. Mm -hmm. I suspect the relationships you're looking at may differ across different sizes of charities and different types of charities as well. You have national charities, you have international charities, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, is this something you're going to uh, take into account uh, when you start, when you put the data collection? Are you, are you going to, or are you expecting that and to see some differences across those different times, or are you just focusing on one particular type, national versus international, etc., or one particular size, and are you just considering uh, smaller charities, etc.? So that's so that's something you may you may think about and, and, and define, uh, or at least have an idea about from now. Yes, I I, ha I have uh, what I'm what I will be working on will be. Um, like SMEs, charities that have got income from a million to under 10 million and in, in analysing or looking at these charities, then they would be compared their corporate governance, transparency and accountability to that of larger charities with um, huge sums of um, income, how <clears throat> their accountability transparency and corporate governance is done and what's the com comparison and also again looking at the gap 
between the operation between the SMEs and then the large charities. So you are considering an improved comparison across the two, two, two different sizes of charities? Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, it would, it would be also interesting to see the different types of charities, as I said, whether they are international, whether they're national as well. Uh, that, that, that could also have any interest. But this, I mean, these are just things. Yes, it, might, it, might come, it might come into play yeah. because within the SMEs as well, as I said, some of them have got international links as well as some of them are just purely UK based. So I would take yeah. take that into, sure. take that on board. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Really Thank you. So now I can, you know, have questions to the formal yeah. so so you've got a question too? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we'll start with you then, and then we'll, we'll go to these. Yes. Oh, okay. I have two. Um, oh, two. Wait, you can see. Two. <laughs> no, not two. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, just just a real quick observation, really. Um, um, I mean, this is obviously a really timely piece of work, given what's happening at the moment and happened over the last six months. What I think I wonder is whether part of that gap is how those organisations view themselves and how individuals within those organisations view themselves. <coughs> and this is purely anecdotal, but I look at sort of work and employment. One of the things about organisations that see themselves as being progressive. Mm -hmm. They tend to not really see the need or feel the need to have sets of standards, internal regulations, etc. Because they're good people, they do good things, they do good work, and, uh, and they tend to be, to be frank, the worst employers because they they, they just assume that they are liberal and they're progressive. And I wonder whether that has something to do with it. Also, particularly, I think just again, just looking at some of the recent scandals just in the news, you know, yeah. I don't know about, a great deal about it. But I think that also creates a barrier for people to make complaints and for people to challenge authority within progressive organisations because in doing that, they are challenging the good that the organisations in theory, in theory does. So there's some of these sort of cultural issues within the organisations, uh, within charitable organisations. Um, obviously not all charitable organisations are possibly progressive, but I'm making a big assumption there. But I think whether that might have yeah, a little part of the story anyway. Mm. Well, some, some, some charities are working towards being transparent, being accountable, and some charities, I wouldn't say, uh, because I don't have authority to say that, but it's just, again, the governance within the whole organisation what do they see as important? What are they reporting? Mm. So my study would look into some of them, maybe after interviewing them and having chat with key personnel within, I might be able to see some of this. But another thing is, um, an area I thought of doing, if even it doesn't come into my study, is a bit of observation. And you know, when you carry out observation, you only see what they want you to see, not what you went there to see. Mm -hmm. see. So there's so many things we can talk about in that area of um, accountability and transparency, how rules are made and, and managed within um, the charities. Yeah. I know um, there's this block of um, spending just the money that they have, or we don't have that money to go into those sorts of things, their money should be spent on what they're actually there to do. I'll move on there as well. I've got, still got two questions, I'm mindful of time, but thank you. This is not really my question, it comes indirectly from Pauline. <coughs> so Pauline has a good idea on top of the next thing, because uh, I was working with her on a project on uh, government and health organisations. But every time I mention the word charity, she, who is a corporate, Lawyer, background, would wave her finger at me and say, Rob, well, what you have to understand is that in English law, being a charity is the kind of organisation that's in English status. That and the comments we've heard about size recently it leads me to wonder um, what, 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 whether one thing you might be thrown into your, what, thrown into your model um, would be to, to think about the different kinds of categories of charity that there are. And comments on size came very close to that. Yes. So you've got you know, things like the National Trust, which are huge commercial organisations, as well as a volunteer that sort of organisation. And the, the other extreme, you've got tiny local charities that just collect and distribute money for what I reckon is the course in all sorts of areas. Yes, yes, thank you for that. Um, in, in my opening chapter, I have got, I've taken into account and uh, more information what a philanthropy is, what a charity is, and the various, the structure of the charity itself, the various types of um, charities and so on, and address those areas. So that will be my introductory chapter in, in, in the work. Unfortunately, I've only got 15 minutes and it's looking like five hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking like five hours from where I'm standing. Yes, there's a lot to talk about and that has featured into my writing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my concern is, uh, I know you, you are aware of ethical research, of course, uh, ethical research, the ethics. Uh, my problem is this. The topic is so great in the sense that uh, I can see it as well. Yeah, 
just like this. Professor Richard said that uh, you want to get in the way of the need that you use to express your character of the things. Anyway, Paul, how do you think you can access people having the length of the methods? Talk to people, of course, when you need. Do you think you cause any challenge in talking to people, accessing people to talk to? And that's key to your research. And that might have to think about the length of the research. Do you think anything, maybe if there's any issue, or maybe you might change the methodology, sorry, the methods? My if, if I, sorry. You're for the yes, yes, I know. Talk to people, is it? I was just with you. And uh, looking at the concept of transparency and uh, ability in, co in corporate governance in China, <coughs> I have not been good named recently. However, due to the sensibility of this work, you might have. Do you think you will encounter challenges in talking to in meeting people to speak with? And as you know, a rigorous PhD research is bounded on the data collection and the way you analyze the work. If that be the case, if you didn't have enough sampling, just like what Dr. Adam said, the sampling factor is very key. Do you think of changing the methods you've chosen from the beginning? Which might be possible. Really? That might be one of the plans right, right at the bottom, but I don't see it very close. I might be a little bit naive right now in, in answering that question, but um, with the help of colleagues, my supervisors, the university, I know I'll encounter difficulty. Of course, it is a topical and very um, um, thin line to cross when you want to interview Key, key personnel within charities, I am going to face um, um, difficulties in, in, in them being open or thoroughly open. But apart from just talking to them, I'll try and do a questionnaire or a survey that might help bring some of the information out that I want. Maybe people will sort of say something better when they write it down face to face, as my colleague earlier on said. So yes, I, I am aware there's going to be there's going to be a hurdle. In, in, in doing that side of, of the work. But I, I, I pray that I am able to um, get over it with some difficulty. But as I said, with some of the, the my colleagues and, and having people that I've worked with um, and so on, it might help in, in, in getting what I want. Maybe not 100%, but a good deal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very diplomatic. <laughs> I'm wondering. sure all the best of luck with that. Thank you very much. So um, without further ado, can I just uh, you know, thank all the presenters again this morning.